Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for attending today's webinar, Sometimes It Takes a Village or a Qualified Medical Child Support Order. Uh, presenting today are Lynn McGuire and Mark Jane Butzelong. Uh, Lynn McGuire is a shareholder in Butzelong's Ann Arbor office and concentrates her practice in the area of employee benefits, including defined benefit plans, defined contribution retirement plans, group health plans, ERISA compliance, and Quinsco determinations. Presenting with her today is Mark Jane. Mark is a senior attorney in Butzlong's Ann Arbor office, and he practices in the areas of ERISA, employee benefits, and executive compensation. Uh, he's handled numerous types of benefit plans, including retirement, severance, health and welfare, and multi-employer fringe benefit plans. Um, now, a few things before we begin the webinar. Um, I want to remind you to please feel free to submit any questions you might have uh, about today's content through the GoToWebinar question panel. Uh, Lynn and Mark will address your questions at the end of the webinar, time permitting. In the event we've run out of time, uh, they will be sure to reach out to you individually. Uh, finally, uh, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, we'll make it available on the Butts Along website later today. Uh, just go to the webinar event page and there will be a link for you to download your copy. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded, uh, so you'll be able to access a copy of the recording in the future by clicking on our YouTube icon on bustle.com or by going to the bustle.com YouTube page. Thank you again for attending today's webinar and here is Lynn McGuire to explain just what is a qualified medical child support order. Good afternoon everybody, thanks for joining us um, and thanks Jonathan for the introduction. Uh, let's start at the very beginning here. Um, I assume most of you are HR people and once in a while you're going to get something in the mail saying um, it's a medical child support order. And essentially this is something that tells you that your group health plan has an obligation to provide medical coverage through your group health plan uh, for a child. And this is not somebody that you enrolled during your open enrollment process. So let's talk about specifically um, what's it going to say. Now, that the order itself might not say it's an order. It might be called a decree or a judgment. It might even be called a property settlement. But in order to be considered a medical child support order, it has to be made under the state domestic relations laws. And, and those are basically the laws for dividing up property and um, obligations when parties get a divorce or separation. So this could include community property law in states that have community property law um, requirements. There are also additional state laws that relate to medical child support, and we'll talk about a couple of those in a minute. Um, and if the order um, provides for child support or health benefit coverage for an alternate recipient under your group health plan, that's essentially what it takes to be considered a medical child support order. It doesn't mean it's enforceable, and we're going to talk today about what it takes to make sure the order is enforceable or qualified. Uh, I've had people call and say, we, we got this thing in the mail, it, it says it's an order, it says we have to provide coverage for this child that we never heard of. It wasn't even issued by a state court. Is this still enforceable? And the answer is, um, it doesn't have to be issued by a state court to be enforceable. Any judgment or decree or order that, that's issued by either court or an administrative agency that has authority to issue child support orders can issue a medical child support order. Uh, this includes things like, you know, locally in Wayne County, it would be the friend of the court agency. There are other agencies throughout the state of Michigan and other states. They all have different names, and they might have slightly different names for what they call their uh, order um, or their agency. But the key is to figure out whether the agency has authority to issue um, orders directing child support. There's also something separate that's a National Medical Child Support Order. Let's talk about what that is. A National Medical Child Support Order is basically a national model order that can be used by any state court or agency that allows them to basically check the box and make sure that they've completed all the information they need to in order to create something that will be considered a qualified medical child support order. 
Um, so it's essentially a state child support enforcement agency that fills out one of these national medical child support orders and it has a notice with it. And then you as the plan administrator um, review that to determine if it's a qualified order. If the national medical child support notice um, is filled out correctly, it serves as a QUIMSCO. And QUIMSCO is the acronym the industry has picked up um, for a ch qualified medical child support order. I don't know how they came up with it. It's a little convoluted, but it's the law of the land now, essentially, if you're going to use an acronym. So QUIMSCOs are um, what I'm going to call them for purposes of this webinar. Now, this notice is treated as if it's an application for your group health plan's coverage. If your plan requires an application, you can't require the individual uh, to go through that separate step if you receive the National Medical Child Support Order and it qualifies. Now let's talk about who can be covered under your plan as a result of one of these QUIMSCOs. They call the person an alternate recipient, and basically that just means it's not your employee, it's somebody different, and you still have to provide them the coverage. They have the right to receive the coverage. Now an alternate recipient is the child of one of your employees um, who's recognized under that QUIMSCO as having a right to enroll under your group health plan. Alternate recipients are treated as if they're beneficiaries under ERISA. So um, for ERISA purposes, you consider them a beneficiary. But for reporting and disclosure obligations to that individual, you treat them as a participant of your plan, even if that order doesn't meet the requirements for being considered a QUIMSCO. So if you get a, a, a medical child support order or a national child support notice, you still basically have to um, provide reporting and disclosure to that individual as if they were a participant. So that would include things like giving them copies of your summary plan descriptions and open enrollment notices, um, that type of thing. Now you don't have to count that individual in your head count um, if you file 5500 or you want to figure out if you're obligated to file Form 5500s for your group health plan. You don't have to count them as a participant. Um, they would still be considered a beneficiary under your plan though. Now, alternate recipients can also be COBRA beneficiaries as well. They have a right to COBRA coverage when their coverage rights end. So any child of a participant in a group health plan who's recognized under that med medical child support order as having a right to enroll under your plan can be an alternate recipient. That's true even if they're a stepchild that doesn't reside with the employee. So if you have separate um, enrollment eligibility rules, Keep in mind that the um, QUIMSCO requirements might supersede your plan's um, provision to that, uh, to that extent. Now, a former spouse can't be an alternate recipient. So, for example, if the order says you have to provide uh, coverage for a former spouse who doesn't have COBRA rights under your plan, that can't be enforced. They can't force you to do that. Now, in order to be considered a qualified medical child support order, in order to be, um, meet the legal requirements to be enforceable against your group health plan, what do you have to have in that order? Well, it has to contain the name and the last address of your participant and of each alternate recipient, so each child essentially, that's to be covered by the order. There is a special rule that lets them substitute the name and the mailing address of a state or a local official for that child's um, address, though. There can be considerations, um, things like um, protective orders may be in place that prohibit your employee from knowing this alternate recipient's actual address. Um, so they can substitute friend of the court, for example, as the address for the uh, alternate recipient. The order has to have a reasonable description of the type of coverage to be provided, or it has to explain how to figure this out. So it can't simply say, um, give this guy coverage, this child coverage. It has to give a little more explanation than that. And it also has to tell you what period of time the order will be effective for. So it has to tell you when it starts and when it stops. Now, some things that they can't do um, just because it's a medical child support order and it says it came from a court or an agency, it doesn't mean they can require your plan to provide any type or form of benefit or any option that's not otherwise provided under your plan 
except to the extent necessary to meet the requirements of certain state laws. And we'll talk about those state laws more. So for example, if you don't offer dental coverage and the order says you have to provide dental coverage, you don't have to do it. It's just not enforceable. Now state laws that affect enrollment in your plan, they used to be a big deal. They're less of a big deal these days um, after the Affordable Care Act, which has expanded the scope of the definition of dependent. Um, but these could include laws like a law that requires a group health insurer to enroll a child under that parent's health insurance, even if they were born out of wedlock, or even if they don't reside with the insured parent, or even if they reside outside of the insurer's service area. It it's also um, includes state laws that require you to provide coverage even if you can't claim that child is a dependent on the parent's federal income tax return. Um, there are also state laws that require health insurers to enroll a child under a court or administrative order um, regardless of your open enrollment restrictions. So essentially, there, there can be straight state laws that say, um, even though this person doesn't have a qualifying event under your plan and it's not open enrollment time, uh, state law can allow the, um, uh, can require that health insurer or you as a, uh, a provider of this insurance indirectly to enroll the child mid-year anyway. Other state laws that you have to be concerned about are those that require employers and insurers to comply with a court order or administrative order that says a parent has to provide health coverage for a child. And that's essentially you know, the whole gist of what a QIMSCO is. And um, state laws that require insurers to per permit a custodial parent to file a claim under your plan on behalf of that child and to make benefit, you know, to require your plan to make benefit payments essentially to the custodial parent or to a health care provider that they've retained. So even though your employee may not be um, the person that lives with this child, um, the law may require you to make the, um, the non-custodial, the non-employee custodial parent the party that gets the benefits on behalf of this child. This might appear, for example, if you have a health reimbursement benefit and the order says you have to cover the child under this health reimbursement benefit, you might be receiving requests for reimbursement from the custodial parent, even though they're not your employee. So if you get a QIMSCO, um, what is it that makes it enforceable? How do you know that this is enforceable or not? If the QIMSCO refers to one of those state laws that I just went through, or if it requires you to comply with those laws, then you have to comply. And essentially, if that's the law and the order says um, we are asserting a right under that law, you're stuck. So for example, a QIMSCO can require your plan to enroll a child before your next open enrollment period even though your plan document doesn't say they can because they haven't met the terms for any um, mid-year enrollment event, no change in status type event. Uh, you are the party that gets to determine whether the order is qualified or not though. And it's not just your right, but it's your obligation. You as the plan administrator determine if the order is qualified and you have to follow reasonable written procedures adopted by the plan when you make this determination. And we'll talk about those written procedures in a moment. Um, but the important thing to remember here is that just because the order is called a qualified medical child support order doesn't mean it really is. It's only qualified if it meets the requirements. And you as the plan administrator are the one that determines if it does meet those requirements. So what are those written procedures for QIMSCOs? Essentially, the, the regulations say QIMSCO procedures have to be in writing. They also say that they have to provide a process um, under which you as the plan administrator are going to notify each person specified in that order uh, who is eligible to get benefits of your QIMSCO procedures. So essentially, your QIMSCO procedures have to say, we will give you a copy of these procedures if you send us a, a QIMSCO. And they have to, your QIMSCO procedures have to permit 
an alternate recipient to designate a representative to act on their behalf. So basically they could designate the friend of the court as the party to get copies of notices that you want to send to that child, that alternate recipient, um, concerning that order. Now, the procedures have to be reasonable, and they have to include these three things. They have to be in writing, they have to provide for notice of the Quimsco procedures to the people named in the order, then they have to allow people to have a designated representative. But you can go beyond that. You can add in provisions into your Quimsco policies and procedures that make your life as the plan administrator a little bit easier. And essentially, this would be things like adding in default provisions that say, if you haven't identified in your Quimsco policies and procedures what uh, of our various types of um, health options under our plan you want to provide to this child, our default is going to be that we will pick the lowest cost option. That would be an, uh, an existing um, type of provision you could add into your Quimsco procedures that makes your life a little bit easier when processing qualified medical child support orders. If you want help with creating your Quimsco policies and procedures, you should definitely seek out the assistance of legal counsel. We've been down the road before and we can help you with those types of um, types of additions to your required Quimsco policies and procedures. Bottom line though, you have to have some. Now what does the administrator have to do when they receive that order? You have an obligation first to notify your participant, your employee, as well as that alternate recipient that's named in the order when you get that Quimsco. Now this, this may seem a little odd that you know, you're getting an order on behalf of this alternate recipient and you have to let them know that you received the order that they sent you, but that's essentially what the rules say. So you notify both parties. The participant might be a bit surprised, but generally um, they tend to know that this is coming. You also have to give them copies of your plan's procedures for determining whether the order is qualified. So those are the Quimsco policies and procedures that we just talked about. Now, it's a little bit different if you get a national medical support notice. If what you receive is a national medical support notice, um, you have a couple of different rules. First. If the individual is no longer your employee, or if they're your employee but they're no longer eligible under your group health plan, you have to complete and send in Part A of the form, it's called employer response, to the agency that issued that notice. And you've got 20 business days after the notice date, the date written on the notice, to send it in. But you are required to send it sooner if it's reasonable to send it sooner. However, if this individual is your employee and they are eligible to participate in your plan, you have to transfer Part B of the notice to the plan administrator within 20 days after the date on that notice. Now, in operation, sometimes the plan administrator is the party that has received this national medical support notice. They tend to just go to the employer generically and not necessarily the party within the employer that services the plan administrator. Now I'm going to um, pass over the reins here to my colleague Mark Jane. He's going to talk with you further about um, um, the rules that apply to Quimsco determinations. Thank you, Lynn, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first question I'm going to tackle is, when must a Quimsco determination be made? Well, again, it depends on whether or not it's a national medical support notice or just a garden variety medical child support order. A national medical support notice, uh, the determination is due by law within 40 days of the notice date. Uh, if it's a medical child support order, it's a little different. The plan administrator must determine whether the order is qualified within a, quote, reasonable period of time after receipt under the circumstances. So that really depends on uh, your business, uh, how, how it runs, and ultimately how the order is established. So let's say you have an order that is clear, complete, you have procedures in place, uh, it's fairly streamlined at your office, There's, uh, it comes into one centralized location, it might only take five days to review that order and get it approved. Uh, however, maybe you get an order that's incomplete, unclear. Uh, that might require longer time, maybe it will require 10. I've seen policies and procedures that kind of use an outlier that no matter what, we are going to do it within 40 days. 
to line up with the National Medical Support Notice, which is fine, but remember the standard still has to be that it's reasonable. Must the plan provide information prior to receipt of a qualified medical child support order? And in short, the answer is yes, and the reason why is because uh, you need, as a plan administrator, you're trying to allow the parties to draft the document that ultimately is compliant. I mean, you want to have a streamlined process, so they might want to know what the terms of the plan are so that they're not providing anything that, remember, one of the things that is not qualified is anything that provides something the plan doesn't allow. So the DOL says that the custodial parents and state child support agencies acting on a child's behalf should have access to the plan and participant benefit information sufficient in order to prepare a Quinsco. This could include such any documents such as a summary plan description, uh, your relevant plan benefit booklets, uh, insurance document, or if you have insured documents, maybe uh, the insurer prepares uh, uh, policy explanations, description, description of coverage options, if any, uh, that have been selected by the participant. Now, the plan administrator may condition disclosure of such information to the party other than a state agency on receiving information sufficient to reasonably establish that the request is, in fact, in connection with the child support proceeding. Now, you might be asking, what happens if an employee has a different election in place, and uh, the, but the Quimsco specifies that the alternate recipient is to receive a particular level of coverage or option available under the plan? Well, in that instance, the participant, if they're not enrolled in that coverage or option, the plan must change the participant's enrollment to the extent necessary to provide the specified coverage to the alternate recipient. Now, some of you might wonder why uh, you could be doing these mid-year elections if you have a cafeteria plan. And cafeteria plans, in general, not allowing mid-year elections because your election should be in place for the full year. Well, it just so happens that is a permissible mid-year change event. Uh, if you get a receipt of a medical child support order. What if the employee is not a plan participant? Well, if the employee is eligible to participate in the plan, then the child must be covered. If the plan requires the employee to be covered as a condition for covering his dependents, then the employee must be enrolled and the plan must enroll both. However, and this goes again to not providing coverage uh, that the plan otherwise doesn't require. If the employee is in a waiting period under the plan, the plan administrator must put a procedure, and this would be something that you would put in your written procedures, they have that in place so that the child's coverage begins at the end of the waiting period. So let's say the employee is in the middle of their 90-day waiting period. Obviously, you can't give the, the coverage to the employee before, the, before that waiting period expires because you'd be in violation of your plan. Well, you'd enroll the employee at the end of the 90, and the child would get that coverage at that same day as well. What happens if the employee contests the validity of the order? And again, this is something that your procedures uh, would be advised to say. Uh, the plan administrator does not determine whether the court or the agency had jurisdiction to issue an order. That's not your job. Whether the state ate whether the state law is correctly applied in an order, again, that goes back to the court or the agency, or whether the service was properly made on the parties, or whether an individual identified in order or in the order as an alternate recipient is the child of the participant. So if the employee contests the validity of the order, that's not in your realm to, uh, to review, or those, those items are not in your realm to review. In other words, you must assume the order is validly issued unless you were advised of an otherwise uh, contradictory order. Who pays for coverage under a Quinsco? And this is kind of a, good, a big reason why a Quinsco exists. Uh, the, ordinar the order will ordinarily establish the obligations of the party for the child's support. Uh, in most cases, the non-custodial parent plan participant is responsible for payment of any costs associated with the coverage. It's kind of how Quinscos get generated in the first place because usually it's the non-custodial parent that is, that, is given the, uh, that is given the obligation to provide the coverage and ultimately pay for it or any, any cost that's involved with it. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, a cafeteria plan pre-tax premium election change is permitted mid-year. If your cafeteria plan does not provide for that, it would need to be amended going forward to allow the election change. Uh, if withholding limits do prevent the reduction of a participant's check, uh, you would need to notify the parties unless the participant voluntarily consents to waive the withholding limit. Uh, in the National Medical Support Order, this so happens to be contained in Part A. Well, what happens if the order is missing information because, I mean, attorneys or lay people, they do their best, but sometimes they're not, they're not going to get them right all the time. So some, there is often that an order is going to have things that are not all there. And again, this goes back to what Lynn was saying, written procedures can help with this. If the order clearly describes the identity and the rights of the parties, but some factual identifying information is incomplete, if that information is within the plan administrator's knowledge or is easily obtained through simple communication with the AR's custodial parent, the participant, or the state child support enforcement agency, then the plan administrator should supplement the order rather than, obje rather than outright object or rejecting it as not qualified. So let's give a common example. Let's say the order misstates the name of the participant and the plan administrator can cl clearly determine the correct name. Well, in that instance, let's say the order provides for uh, the name of the participant is John Smith, and you only have one John Smith, and it gets the address right uh, because the John Smith that you have on file is, is that address. Well, you can pretty much, but uh, let's say it, or uh, let, let me back up and say, let's say the order says it's John Smith, but you have a Jack Smith, but the address is the same, and you only have one person by the name of Smith at your at your your place of business and that address is right well then you probably can clearly determine the correct name in fact if you even reach out and they confirm it that's probably going above and beyond what you're supposed what you could be doing but uh, in that instance it's within your knowledge and you can figure it out uh, if the order's description of coverage is unclear the order should be rejected unless the plan administrator can determine which options and level of coverage should be provided if it's a national medical child support order, you must assume all coverage types are involved unless stated otherwise. So let's give a couple examples of that. Let's say the order requires that the child be provided, quote, any coverage available under the plan. Well, in that instance, the plan administrator would determine what coverage is avail available under the plan, for example, major medical, hospitalization, dental, and provide that coverage because any coverage under the plan being pretty, pretty wide open. But let's say the plan offers more than one type of coverage, for example, an HMO and a PPO, and the order does not say which should be provided or how the choice is to be made. The plan administrator should reject the order unless the Quimsco procedures contain a default election. And again, that's how the written procedures, if they're detailed enough, uh, providing for these uh, scenarios can only help matters for everybody involved. So what are the time frames for a Quimsco? First of all, when must the coverage begin? Well, the alternate recipient and the participant, if necessary, if they're not yet enrolled, must be enrolled as of the earliest possible date following the determination that the order is a Quimsco. So let's say a, a plan start date is the first day of each month. Uh, the plan would be required to provide the coverage the first day of that first month following the determination that the order is qualified. And then when should it end? Well, the plan may drop alternate recipient coverage at the same time and under the same circumstances as it can for other dependents. Let's say the participant terminates employment. Well, again, you're not supposed to provide coverage beyond what the plan otherwise requires. So, the and the alternate recipient doesn't elect COBRA. Remember, again, it's a COBRA. Uh, the alternate recipient has COBRA rights. Uh, in that instance, the coverage would end. Uh, you in that instance, you must provide notice to a custodial parent or the state agency, and if it's national medical support order, uh, you'd use Part A. If the, if the order actually specifies an end date for the employee support obligation, or if the agency sends notice that the support obligation is ending, the employee's pre-tax premium obligation, well, that ends because there's no more support obligation. But the group health coverage must be available to the end of the month the child reaches age 26. As you know, that's an, that's an ACCA requirement, uh, ACCA being the Affordable Care Act. Uh, again, coverage rights apply if coverage ends due to a COBRA qualifying event. 
Uh, what are your record keeping requirements for a Quimsco? Well, by law, a medical child support order must be sent to the employer rather than the plant administrator, and the employer keeps a copy of that order and all related communications in, the, in their employment files. Uh, the plant administrator uh, ought to keep copies of the Quimsco and all related communications. Uh, HIPAA privacy requirements do apply here, so watch out for any protected health information that might be in it. Uh, you should retain a Quimsco for a minimum of three years following the end of the plan year in which the Quimsco no longer applies. So again, that goes to when the coverage ends under the Quimsco. And how should you send determinations and notices out? Well, uh, if the order or state agency provides a fax number, then you can send facsimiles uh, for determinations and notice. We, we tend to think the best practice is to send a paper copy by U.S. mail, keeping, a, keeping maybe a return receipt if you can, or evidence that the document was sent out. Uh, for notices to employee, the company email system delivery is usually not recommended. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lynn and Mark, uh, for this presentation. Uh, now I'm going to open this up to questions. It looks like I have one here. Bring this up. Okay, here's a question. Um, if an employee has waived coverage and we receive an order to add dependent to coverage, how is this handled? Even if the employee has waived coverage, you're required to enroll the dependent. And if your plan requires the employee to also be enrolled, you're required to enroll the employee. Now, that doesn't answer the question of what do you do if you gave them opt-out cash. And essentially, there's no automatic mechanism for getting back opt-out cash that you gave an employee. So this is a good reason to structure your opt-out cash design in a month-by-month -month basis rather than a lump sum basis. All right. And it looks like, oh, here's another question. Um, are there any income requirements uh, that cannot be more than a certain percentage of wages? There are. Those are rules that apply under state laws. Um, and unfortunately, they, they vary um, based on the income of the employee, and they vary state by state. So I'm... I believe Michigan has a 40% withholding limit. Don't, although, don't quote me on that, but that number stands out in my mind off the top of my head. So. And there are some exceptions to the rule as well. So if you do have a specific question for an individual, it's best to check, the, um, check with legal counsel at that time. Okay, uh, any other questions? I don't see anything coming in. Um, as you can see up on the screen, here's a contact information for our presenters, Lynn McGuire and Mark Jane. Um, if after reviewing the material you come up with more questions, please feel free to contact them. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, a copy of the slides as well as a link to a recording will be available later on this afternoon. And I believe that is it. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you presenters and everyone have a great afternoon.